welcome to Cyber Therapy, episode 12. This is Ashley Lee, your host, and I am here with Tyler Shields, my co-host. Say hello. Hello. How's everybody doing today? Great to see <laughs> slash hear you all or or maybe get messages from you all. Type under that little chat. Yeah. Um, I'm super excited about today's episode because we've got two wonderful guests who are all about learning and getting into cybersecurity and making making waves. Um, and so, but before we get into that, I do, I want to ask Tyler a question. Uh-oh. How are you feeling after last night's loss? Oh, you Kansas? had to bring that up? Really? You're, you're <laughs> going to do that now on live stream? <laughs> <sighs> so for those of you that aren't aware, there was a, a sports game round ball thing last night. Uh, called the NCAA National Championship, where my alma mater, the University of North Carolina Tar Heels, were in the national championship against the Kansas Jayhawks. And uh, yeah, we lost uh, by three points, a very heartbreaking loss. But um, in all honesty, we didn't lose the national championship game. We lost the national championship game the week before when half of our team got injured trying to beat Duke uh, and beating Duke, which quite honestly, I would almost rather beat Duke in that game than win the national championship. It's that important to me. But I did wear and I did represent my Carolina blue today. Um, so, yeah, I had, had to. Did you step and watch the game, Ash, or is that is round ball basketball games not your thing? Nah, not college basketball, no. I am. You watch NBA? Occasionally. I'm a Warriors fan. Um that's Why? how my husband and I met. So the kind really? of has a yeah. It has okay, that's and news to me. That's pretty to cool. Our, to my heart. Yeah. Uh, so you met at a game? Yeah, through a mutual friend. She decided to invite a whole bunch of friends, and we're going. This was when tickets were like twelve dollars. So before they made it big. That was like nineteen forty two. Like I didn't know you could uh, ever get tickets to an NBA game yeah. for twelve dollars. The, the nosebleeds were 12 bucks and um, wow. it was four, four, us four girls and him because he was the driver um, of all of us all the way up to the game. And uh, yeah, she that was the first time I met him and he was just trying to keep all of our names straight and never thought we'd see each other again. And then eventually we saw each other again and sparks flew and oh, now we're What here. a wonderful story. And, and all this yeah. time I've known you, I never, ever heard that story. That's yeah. pretty awesome. So, Warriors games, they have a place in my heart. So Yeah. One of these days, I'll regale you with the how, how I met my wife story, which is not nearly as endearing, much more embarrassing, and not nearly <laughs> as much fun. So, But, but let's save that for later. Let's tease that into episode 13. Yes. Episode 13, we can reveal how I met my wife. Sounds great. All <laughs> right. Well, so on to today's show, we, as I said and uh, earlier, we've got two wonderful ladies who are all about learning, and I'm really excited to hear about their stories getting into cyber and whatnot. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on Dr. Meg Layton and Jasmine Henry. Woo! Woo! Welcome I to, need to two add wonderful like folks. How are you? Hey. Hey, we're I good. Am, I'm good. I've had a week off work, so I'm I'm chill. Yeah, a week without a week without uh, you know your your awful boss beating down you know yes being this being mean to you here. all those wonderful things right for those that don't know Jasmine's on the team here at Jupiter One so she's been a wonderful addition to the team and actually um, I'm going to call out a big shout out right now for the amazing work that she did on the Scar Report the State of Cyber Asset Report would never have become a reality if it weren't for the wonderful Jasmine on my team so. Uh, very public thank you, Jasmine. That's pretty awesome. Thank you. Woo. I appreciate that. It was really fun. It was it was uh, kind of an intense week or two, um, and there was a lot of moments where I didn't think I I would make it. Um, kind of analyzing the data and writing the report, but I feel like I need that kind of challenge every couple months. Well, good. We're going to give that to you. I'm I'm good <laughs> at, at making people do my work, so it's all good. I will just keep outsourcing everything to you. Yes, because you know you already committed her to four reports this year, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Are we doing four too? Oh wait, you hadn't heard. You hadn't heard. Okay, well, we'll, we'll give you the details later. Don't worry about that oh, right gosh. now. Let's move on to a different topic. Doctor Meg, how are you? Welcome to the show. Um, 
What do you think, Ash? Should we just uh, start with a little introductions or how do you want to open today? Yeah. Dr. Meg, give us a little bit of your background because I know that you you also crossed paths with Tyler in the, pa- in the past. So, so um, we have. Just hear from you. Yeah. All right. So um, I started in technology many, many decades ago. We'll just leave it at that, that it was a long time ago as a database administrator and network administrator. And um, once I had built out a couple networks in a database, I was like, okay, I'm done here and went on to work for an international telecommunications company doing business in Africa. And um, at the time, Africa was in the middle, the countries we were in were in the middle of a bunch of civil wars and strife. And um, they had challenges with security that maybe we don't necessarily see in the United States. And that was where I really got interested in security. And I started learning a little bit about security. Fun fact, I was first published by SANS in 2000 while I was working there in one of their community consensus projects. And I was like, oh, I need to learn more about this. This is becoming really critical. And I left to work for a startup company called Mountain Wave. We were acquired by Symantec a year after I joined them. And then I spent 20 years at Symantec um, in various and sundry roles. I did leave Symantec and the division I was in was sold off to Accenture. I left that just about a year ago. I now work for Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. Um, security architecture and engineering and protecting kind of our most vulnerable in this area. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm really curious. So was it the job that got you sparked your interest in cyber or were there, were there other? So I, I like to say that I was in cyber before I knew cyber was a thing I could be in <laughs> because of the way the dot com era kind of just exploded in technology. I think that really helped kind of move things along. But I, I like way early on, um, I was in one of the first movies I ever went to see was War Games and the ability to kind of manipulate technology and get behind it. I was in high school at the time and I remember thinking, oh, this is very cool. But uh, honestly, a lot of the first technology I worked with was backstage. I was a stage technician. So my computer was the lighting board and the sound board. And that did lead into other things because when I went to work for the nonprofit that I started in technology at, they were like, hey, you're not afraid of things with plugs. How about we send you <laughs> networking classes and you learn how to build a network for us? And I said, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, That's so, some great opportunities there. Hey, hey, while we're on this topic, um, because Dr. Meg brought it up. I do. Do we want to talk about the movie question now and see where it sure. takes it? Or do we Go want to wait for it? Go for it. It's got to be brought up, right? Because <laughs> during the prep, so uh, for the audience members that don't know, we do a prep call um, for each one of these where we bring the guests and we just kind of, you know, dig into their background a little bit, try to understand what makes them tick to, to tease out the best content. And one of the comments that, that Dr. Meg brought up was, uh, I think she brought it up or maybe we did, but we started talking about uh, the most influential movies, TV shows, in cybersecurity careers. Um, and for me, it was War Games. And that was because when War Games came out in the 80s, I was literally dialing stuff with my modem. I was war dialing every night. My mom and dad were like, why does why does the phone keep clicking on a thousand times a night? They really didn't understand what I was doing, had no clue what was going on. And then War Games came out and I'm like, that's me. <laughs> it really home, right? like, literally, I was Matthew Broderick in my brain in middle school, right? Um, Jasmine, what what was your most influential cybersecurity movie? And before you answer, on my Twitter, twitter.com slash TXS, I have, a, I have a, a poll going. So we can go on there. We're gonna, that poll will be alive for the next 24 hours, and we can see what, what our audience on Twitter has to say. But Jasmine, what's your most influential cybersecurity movie? I think it's about 70% war games and 30% hackers, just because hackers has female representation and ah. the other kind of, you know, two big ones don't. That's true. Allie, I can't remember her name, the the actress who played alongside Matthew Broderick Sheedy. in war games. Ali Sheedy, yes. She is an underappreciated character in that because nothing would have happened had she not funded and gotten on that plane and got him out to that island and that was all because he called her and said please come rescue me like let's face it 
I'm not definitely not going <laughs> to deny that. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So you would say, so you're hedging your bets. You're doing a 70, 30, but when you do a poll, you can only click one checkbox, Jasmine. Come on. Um, war games, I think. All right. Yep. Dr. Meg. So, so I'm sort of with Jasmine, although I have to say, and I see we have chat that agrees with me. I'm going to go with sneakers. And that's only because while well, war games was the first one I saw sneakers, you needed the full team for that to come out and I everybody had their own is, talent and you have would, to in cybersecurity know that. Definitely agree with that. I would definitely say sneakers is probably closer to the reality of what turned into pen testing back in my early stages of the career, which overlapped quite a bit, I believe, with some of the stuff that you did, Dr. Meg. But, yep. you know, it, I wouldn't be complete without asking my wonderful co-host, Ashley. You know, you're, well, you come from a non-traditional cyber background. You're, you're recently entered into cyber. Do you have any influential, influential movies? If so, are they even later in the career, maybe? Or what's your most influential cybersecurity movie? Uh, I can't say that cybersecurity movies are my thing, but I do have a thing for grifters and um, anything with TV shows with grifters and stealing stuff. Like Italian Ooh. Job is one of my favorite, favorite Ooh. all-time movies um, with Charlize Theron. And even though everybody hates on Marky Mark, like it was still a great movie. Um, and the fact that Charlize Theron gets to, you know, punch, punch at Ed Norton at the end makes me feel good. So we can um, put that in as a write in vote for you. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. I, I will say that everybody always talks about the big ones when it comes to this, but there are some very underappreciated other ones like Ocean's Eight, I think it is. The yes. one. Like I that's a good one. Movies. Like yeah. that that that's really I think um Home Alone from a, a social engineering perspective is yeah. one of the best ones that where the kids social engineering and the bad guys are social engineering and everybody's sort of social engineering each other. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just sort of fun. And um, I mentioned this just before we went live that Jumpin' Jack Flash is one of my, my favorite from a... Um, here's spies and random opening chat channels and finding keys on the back of frying pans, which are an underappreciated weapon in the world. I'm going to make a plug for Mad Max Fury Road, um, which I think is one of the most feminist movies ever made. But I think that there's some kind of hidden themes about maybe the integrity and availability parts of the CIA triad, because there's a lot of information control and misinformation. Oh. Um, <laughs> I no, that's that's so interesting really cool. that you're making these connections to cybersecurity because I never would have thought of that. Like, I think Mad Max is a great movie, um, but I never would have connected the dots between cyber. So, thank you for that. I'm curious to know since you guys have been in the industry much longer than I have, I'm wondering. Not that was not meant to be a slight, by the way. I was not say, intended wait, wait, wait. at all. So hold on. Yeah, what are you trying to say? <laughs> But I want to know what keeps you going, right? Because you, you've you been in the industry for a while. You've stuck with it, right? What keeps you going through, through all the changes, ups and downs, especially with the onslaught of breaches that we've been having and just, you know, um, a lot of the news articles, right? So wondering, I mean, we can start with Jasmine. would love to hear from your perspective what keeps you going and then go around in the circle. I think security is the only thing that's really kept my attention very long. Um, it's kept my attention for over a decade, uh, which is which is unusual for me. It feels right. Um, it feels like like what I'm supposed to be doing. And there's also, uh, you know, I'm sure somebody could psychoanalyze the, the heck out of this, but I feel like I'm making the world a better place. I feel like I'm protecting employees. I'm protecting customers. I'm protecting the common person. Um, and that that is a good feeling to me. I feel like I'm doing ethically good work. Awesome. Dr. Meg, how about you? So I think that's right. Um, security is the mission that matters. I'm going to quote my Buffy here because that's a Buffy quote. But but it's one of those things that when you can go home and you can feel good about what you're doing and that you've made that contribution, that's super important. In security, we have a thing um, where people tend to say defenders have to be right every time, attackers only have to be right once. It's sort of something like that. I think that's sort of a defeatist attitude and that we have a bit of a secret weapon behind that. And it 
because it always reminds me of um, a Buffy and Spike scene. So clearly, if you haven't already figured that out, I'm a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer <laughs> fan. Um, and there's a there's a scene where Spike says to Buffy, you know, you can kill a hundred, a thousand, a thousand, thousand, and the armies of hell besides. And all we need is for one of us, just one, sooner or later, to have the thing we're all hoping for, which is just one good day. But I like to think that that's the same thing that motivates the defenders. Because when we have a good day and somebody may, and we make the save or we powered the network for good things or we understand our contribution into that mission that matters, um, that powers you through the next kind of bump in the road and keeps you going. So I like to think that that one good way goes both ways and we get our one good day. I, I, I have on this side, a slide on my wall, which is from one of my one good days and it powered me for like two years because I was involved. Somebody called me and said, hey, I need you to help. This this news organization is um, being taken down but by basically a neo-Nazi site and they can't reach people who can help them because the way that the the support calls were structured like you had to have access to the site that they couldn't get access to and it was a big old mess and so you know i tried to enable the the connections and just basically call people and at the end of it i got this thing that said hey now you're a nazi hunter and good for you because the site's back up and running and i was like can i put that on my linkedin profile <laughs> right, because it was, but but when somebody comes to you and said you did the thing, and here now this is working, like that powers you through. I printed it out. I stuck it on my wall. I said, no matter what else happens, this happened today. Mm -hmm. You know, and it kept going. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. You are a Nazi hunter forever. <laughs> I like. Actually, you should add that to the wall behind you. I should add what Nazi hunter? <laughs> yeah, the, your, the thing that you so got printed out. So it is. Oh. It's here. And um, when I w last went to a comic con, I had James Marster sign it, and we had a whole discussion about how different Buffy would have been in today's technology from when it was. But but he did sign it for me, and was super excited that I so used that quote altogether. I have I have an, I have a admission to make, a confession to make. I have never once in my entire life seen an episode of Buffy. Oh, what? Now you just alienated all sorts of people. <laughs> I know, right? I'm sure. I, I'm sure I ticked off like half of the Twitter sphere, but I have never seen more than literally 30 seconds. Like I know it's Sarah Michelle Gellar. That's right. Am I right? With that? You're right. And mm -hmm. that's literally all I know about that show. Well, Tyler, you're going to take some time off. I think in May. I am. Yeah. Yep. So perhaps you could. I have, you how could many seasons? Buffy. Are there like eight thousand seasons? Of like eight thousand. Yeah. Okay. I got enough time to watch at least two. <laughs> I have a Nazi comment, however. That was my tabletop scenario like two, three years oh, ago. Oh, really? really? Yeah, it was a DDoS attack by um, men's right activists because I thought that was, you know, something that everybody would get really ticked off about in the tabletop. Um, and when I brought that up, a recent tabletop, I got laughed at, but apparently it really <laughs> happened. It really so happened. It actually makes sense. So very quickly, Jasmine, I want to double click on that because... I'm not sure of the the cybersecurity experience level of all of our audience. Can you explain mm -hmm. what a tabletop exercise is and then what you did sure. with that? So a tabletop exercise is a discussion-based incident simulation, um, typically involving members of kind of a leadership team who may be uh, making decisions during a real-world incident. Um, it is a best practice. It is often also a compliance requirement that you kind of talk through you know, here's this incident going on. Here's what's just happened. You've got different information inserts. Um, so as the tabletop facilitator, you're kind of uh, controlling a little bit of, you know, what's what's going on and what people are finding out to, to facilitate ideally good discussion. Um, and kind of an ideal outcome is that people have a pretty good idea of how incident prepared you are, what your resources are like, and maybe ways to get better as well. Yeah, we recently did one of these under Jasmine's uh, uh, Dungeon Master Eye. Uh, here at Jupiter One, um, and I was quite impressed with it. Actually, I thought it was really neat. I had never really gone through one that that facilitated it the way quite quite the way that you achieved that, Jasmine. Um, and at the end of the day, I felt like we were definitely better prepared than we had walked into that particular session. Um, 
Credit so, to Eric Smith, though, because he introduced some fake log evidence that I didn't even know he was going to introduce. Oh, you so didn't I even feel know like that he, was coming. Uh, I knew some of it was coming. Uh, not not all of it, but I feel like he did a really good job introducing. So I think we should create yeah. a game, a formal game that's like Dungeons and Dragons for these tabletop exercises, where you can actually do roll a 20 twenty sided die to determine <laughs> there actually is the a game that, that, that occurs. There is a That'd game that does fun. that. Really? Yeah, backdoors and breaches from uh, Black Hills. You pull the cool. card, you roll the twenty sided die. It's all those sort of things. It's if it, well, it injects that. things right in. You need a dungeon master to roll it. I use it with my uh, cyber patriot groups quite a bit. So, so talk a little bit more about that, Doctor Meg. Uh, you, what do you use it with specifically? What group? And then, kind of, what do they get from it? So, I do use it with my cyber patriot groups um, because cyber patriot focuses on very much on protection of the system, but I try to stress with the youth that there's lots more to running a system than the hardware and the software that sits on it. And communications with your organization is part of running that system effectively. And the, the, basically that, that game really helps draw that out. It, it you know, suggest when you should call legal, suggest where your marketing team is, make sure you're all on the same page and you all know where your policies are and things like that and brings in that different perspective so that then when they go to talk to an interviewer or a college or people that, that they head on, I mostly deal with high school and I'm dealing with cyber patriot, um, but they, they're they familiar with those discussions and have an opportunity to have thought through who else might be interested in, in kind of the attacks that are going on and who else might need to be involved and basically try to dispel the whole um, you are only defending this computer and you're doing it all by yourself because that's very seldom true, right? You're defending, yeah. yes, but you're involving everybody else in the organization in that defense. This makes me so excited. So uh, Jasmine's going to be doing another one internally and I like volunteered because I want to be a part of it and see what it's like. Um, so it makes me nervous, partly because half the stuff that you just listed off, I'm like, I, I need to think about where I need to find those things. Um, but at the same time, I figure it's a team effort. So there will be other people at the table. I'm excited really for excited. that one. Yeah, I obviously can't say what it's going to be, but it, there's going to be a very human element. Um, it's a scenario I've wanted to do for about 18 months. And I think it's going to be my scariest one yet. <laughs> I love it. All right. To pivot a little bit, I wanted to kind of drill in Dr. Meg. You've got doctor at the front. And Jasmine, I believe you are on your way to acquiring doctor into your name as well. So wanted to kind of dig. Yeah. Bye, Tyler. I can put you backstage now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to kind of dig into uh, your studies. What are you studying? Dissertation, that sort of stuff. Um, but first off, what prompted you to go back to school and get extra credentials? Either one of you can start. Yeah. I'll, okay, I'll go ahead about my PhD. <laughs> All right, Dr. Mike, you go first. Okay, um, so a long time ago in a land far away, um, my dad passed away. My dad was a public high school teacher. And so, you know, I, I therapeutically <laughs> blogged about this and, and used a blogging platform to kind of talk through a specific security issue we were having at the time. And on about my third post about this, somebody called me and they basically said to me, hey, um, you know, it's lovely that you're offering this out here, but if you really wanted to study that, that's really like doctoral work. And have you ever thought about going to school for your for your doctorate and and really uh, it was at a time where you know my kids were young they hadn't hit high school yet it was a, it was like all things came together for me in kind of a perfect storm for it to be a good time for me to consider that in my career so I did obviously with with parents who are educators a formal path of study means something to me. <laughs> I recognize that that's not true for everybody, but I will also say that a doctorate never expires. So while I pursue certifications, I don't have to keep my doctorate up in any way 
shape or form. It just is there and is a credential which won't expire. But it was also kind of a perfect storm of timing and a way to kind of honor my dad and be like, hey, dad, you know, here I am continuing my education. So that's well, super interesting. Jasmine, give us a little bit of reason why you, you're going through school. Well, I feel like a um, PhD had always been the plan. However, a PhD in STEM was not the original plan. I wanted to get a PhD in Russian, um, but I finished undergrad in 2010, which was right after the kind of 2008 financial crash. So I got into the most prestigious graduate program for Russian, but without funding. I remember getting that letter. And even at 22, I was not foolish enough to take out loans for a PhD in Russian. Yeah. Um, so I went and worked in technology, which I'd already been doing for a few years. Um, I put myself through college, um, working in technology, continued doing that, um, realized I wanted to do security, realized that you could do security in the, in the private sector. I thought it was something that you could only do at you know, three-letter agencies previously. And nobody would hire me for security. I was kind of working in cloud, cloud native development um, and hiring managers didn't want to hire me because I didn't have enough on the clock experience with routers. I remember hearing Cisco a lot. Um, <laughs> And so I, I went, um, I went back to school at 25. Um, at the time, I thought that security was going towards analytics, and I was right. Um, and that was how it started. Yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. Like, you know, I think it's interesting. You both commented on a couple of things, um, Dr. Meg. You commented on, you know, the value of education, obviously, but also the value of certifications. And there's, you know, appropriate times and places for everything. And Jasmine, you 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 spoke about the value that you put on a formal education and, and why you went back. Um, you know, it's always a tricky thing when people bring this topic up on Twitter or on, on LinkedIn or, or face-to-face. There's always the, well, do we need education for cybersecurity, you know, analyst roles? And do we need certificates and how much experience really is junior entry? Do we need an eight plus years experience for a junior position, right? And it's always such a debate that occurs. Um, you know, do you guys have any color on how you see the cybersecurity landscape with regards to hiring entry level people versus hiring significantly educated people? Do we need certificates? Do we need uh, higher education? Do we need to focus on, hey, let's just get people into cybersecurity in a general sense, because we need to solve a, a, a person power problem that exists, right? What are your guys' thoughts on that? Jasmine, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, well, I don't really think there's a skill gap. I think there's a skill mismatch because there's a ton of entry-level folks who want to work in security and a ton of job openings that are kind of mid-level or senior. Um, and I think that a lot of things need to change, but one of them is perhaps hiring practices. Um, I think that certs or education can be fine because people come from different backgrounds. Perhaps somebody who's former military may have certifications. They may not have a four-year degree. That's great. Um, or somebody who came through kind of education like me may have degrees, but not, not certs for an entry-level job. Also fine. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of things <laughs> need to change. And one thing I will say is that it Nobody should be expecting some of the nine thousand dollar certs for an entry level job. That's that's absolutely unreasonable. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, Doctor Meg, what's your color on that? Um, so I don't disagree with anything Jasmine said. I, I think that it's less of a skill mismatch and more of a job reclassification. You have your database administrators, your network administrators, they're already doing security. They may not consider themselves security, but they're already doing security is the reality of it. And it's just a matter of elevating them um, into formal roles that help define that for them. Um, I uh, clearly am a security um, security certification fan, but that's because that, that works for me. It helps me time bound my knowledge and it time bounds yeah. my, my learning and it gives me an opportunity to put hands on boxes and get through learning about new technologies or learning about things that maybe I don't have time for in my day to day everyday job. I'm not going to say everybody needs that. When I hire people, I use, they have to show me they have finished something, started and finished mm. something. I don't care if it's a degree. 
I don't care if it's a certification. I don't care if it's they built out their lab. They have to have started and kept the interest long enough to have finished whatever that goal is. That's really helps me understand a little bit of attitude and aptitude. Um, some certifications, if your job requires certification for whatever reason, which a lot of a lot of classifications and there's a lot of um, different industries and kind of that require you to be certified and sure. I believe the, the organization should pay somebody to do that. I do not believe we hire our entry level people and hope that they have that certification. If you require it, you should pay for it just yeah. as you do for everything else you require of the people. Um, and, and have the time to get there. Like, I don't expect them to be able to do that on their first day. But um, I also think a lot about it. I think it's it's fraught with, um, like, it's always a hot topic because people don't want to devalue whatever they've spent their money on. And really, <laughs> I get that. Yeah. But we also have to make security accessible for everybody and, and pivot people who perhaps are in roles that you maybe didn't consider are already doing security. Yeah. It's the, remember back into history, and I think in our prep show notes, we talked a little bit about this. Dr. Meg, you and I were both involved in writing the CSSLP, right? The right. Certified Cybersecurity... <laughs> Software lifecycle practitioner. That's it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, well done. So we both actually helped write that certificate. Uh, I, I'm a former CISSP, a former CSSLP. I have two master's degrees. And it's funny, you know, I, I think for me, my journey through education is, I think, a little bit different than both of yours. Um, I was actually a horrible student in undergrad, absolutely horrible student. I barely made it through. I was on probation, off probation, nearly kicked out of school many, many times. Took me eight years to get my undergrad degree. Um, yet somehow I managed to go back and, and find two master's degrees in my future. And what it was for me was not about education. It was about self-challenge. It was about becoming stagnant in my role. And I've had this conversation with Jasmine, I believe, previously. It was about becoming stagnant in where I was and felt like my current employer at the time wasn't giving me what I needed to grow. So I took it into my own hands and said, I'm going to go do something to help myself grow. And both of those times happened to be two-year master's degrees that I focused on and completed. But I think there's a certain something to be said for choosing one's own path of growth, right? And that can be master's degrees. It can be cert cert certificates, certifications. It can be CTF experiences. It can be uh, writing open source code, right? It can be any number of things in the cybersecurity space that help you grow as a person. But the key there is finding what gets you excited and choosing to do that. Happen to be master's degrees for me. It sounds like it happened to be some PhDs for you too. But I think it's. I think they're all valuable, valuable progressions. I mean, does that does that resonate? Absolutely. Yeah. I hired a pen tester uh, a couple of years ago who had no formal pen test experience, but he'd been on Hack the Box for like over a year and had great ranking on Hack the Box. And he'd also been in a job that I felt like really sounded horrible. He was migrating like legacy ERP to the cloud, and I, I, you know, had a lot of thoughts about like that sounds like great <laughs> customer service. Um, but I agree. Yep. It's about doing something consistently. Right. And I'm so I'm a huge fan of the CTF challenges and kind of being able to get in there and try new things and learn new things. And I do a lot of presentations because a lot of people are, uh, I think, put off. They don't really know what to expect from a CTF. So they're like, I don't have enough experience to do that. And I keep telling them, look, you go points on the board, learn something new. You've had a good day. Like, stop worrying about whether you know enough to do it. Like, go yeah. and learn. Yeah, imposter syndrome is real. Dr. Mag, if I remember correctly, you are you a black badge holder at, at DEF CON? Was that you? That I, I was am talking not, to no. Recently? Okay. <laughs> All right, well. No, uh, I actually try try not to go, <laughs> except for maybe <laughs> once every 10 years. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a recovering uh, black badge holder for two years, actually. I won two black badges at, at DEF CON back nice. in the late 90s. Ooh, dating wow. myself there. But, wow. but yeah, that's... um. Former life. I, I don't think I could hack my way out of a wet paper bag with a blowtorch today. So, so it's a bit of a different world I live in now. But Ash, go ahead. I was just going to say the nice thing. So <clears throat> um, my last company that I was at uh, was my first cybersecurity company. And through 
OWASP, like going to the AppSec USA and AppSec, like the local chapters, there are actually a good number of folks who put on like CTFs just for novice, which yes. has been awesome. And I've really enjoyed this because that gives me, it oh, lowers like the anxiety around it, right? Of like, I'm going to be with like all these people who are pros. I'm going to look like an idiot. Yeah, we got to make sure we got to make sure we get some of those links, Ash. If, if anybody watches this and has a, a link to something like that, that they want to promote, we're happy to put it on our, uh, our Twitter feed and talk about it on the next show and the stuff that you've done in the past. I'd love to promote that actually. Cause yeah. I think finding, finding the entry level to help people so they don't feel afraid and they don't feel scared. Um, yes. That's super important. Well, and finding, yeah. finding what you can give as well as what you can get becomes important. I always tell people that when I first had my children, like I got back into CTFs because between two and four in the morning when my children decided to wake up, I was sort of bored. And so I found this other group of mothers who also only had that time and we would like collaborate during that time on on different challenges that were online and you know but as long as we were all honest and be like this was the time span we had <laughs> and why we were in that time span like it was super easy to kind of play off each other and figure out what each other's strengths were and work through challenges that way do you mind if i double click on that for a second because sure. i think um so you you talked at PancakeCon in January and that was they just recently posted the videos and I was listening to it and I'd love to just hear a little bit more from your perspective on how how you find these communities like is it just a matter of just putting yourself out there and asking questions or do you get connected from people or like how does that work um so yes on all levels so I I have to say the Semantic Alumni Network is wide and ever-reaching, so I maintain <laughs> connections there. But it is a matter of finding the right people to connect with in a method that you are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So originally, back when my kids were young, that was Facebook. And honestly, it was a Facebook group I was in where a couple of people were like, hey, has anybody ever tried this random thing? And I kind of connected with them that way. Um, now it's mostly Slack communities and different Slack mm -hmm. communities. I do um, Women's Society Cyber Jitsu, the Diana Initiative, I think is how I originally connected with Jasmine. And, and it's a matter of connecting with groups of people you are super comfortable with. Like I'm, I'm all excited we have a Slack channel for our book authors because like that helps me connect with these random people that aren't in any of my other Slack channels, <laughs> but they're super motivating and they hop on and they say, motivating things and they we keep each other going and you know that's just awesome for me so i will say that that that's a matter of just reaching out like linkedin is a thing now mm -hmm. and you know reach out to somebody i was at the women in cyber conference and i literally said to a bunch of people i said reach out on linkedin and say don't forget you met me at the Women in Cyber Conference and I am looking for X and mm -hmm. so that I can send them the links that are relevant or groups that they might be, you know, be interested in joining. It is a matter of making that first connection and asking that question. Mm -hmm. But then they kind of like, there's nothing wrong with lurking for a while before you have <laughs> yeah. the ability to contribute, like not for nothing, but I'm on news groups from, you know, the nineties still where I get things in my email yeah. and I'm like, oh, I should probably respond to that random thread. <laughs> you know? No, that's, that's super interesting. So, so for those that don't know, I actually spent a few years at Symantec. Um, and for those that don't remember, there was something back in the mid 2000s at Symantec where they had some advertisements wearing yellow suits. Um, <laughs> Dr. Meg, did you ever have to wear a yellow suit, maybe similar to like something like this? <laughs> So I never had to wear a yellow suit, but I did have to arrange for the Norton security man to show up at my child's school occasionally. So that was the thing, the Norton <laughs> security man, kind of like a sports ball athletic like mascot. mascot? <laughs> no, he was like um, a superhero kind of, he would kind of look like a transformer. It was a whole suit. Wow, that is awesome. Wow, that I'm I'm doing a quick Google. I can't find a photo of Norton Man. Uh, you know, the it was like I have 
is the yellow suits that, <laughs> yeah, that no, no. I did if wear, you look, I used there, to wear. He, he was like a little transformer man. He wasn't little. It was a person. But but yes, occasionally we could get them to show up at the LA That's school. absolutely fantastic. But the reason I brought up the yellow suits was the, the network. Um, there's a certain amount of value that you get just from making connections and learning to be okay with you know meeting people and being open. I remember my first first uh, DEF CON was 97, maybe 98. I think it was DEF CON 6. It was in the downtown strip. And I met a group of folks there randomly by sitting at a CTF table with them and got connected with a whole group of folks that later went on to many of them found companies. Many of them, you know, we all won CTFs together. We all we all helped run the, the DEF CON CTF for a number of years. And there's just, you know, a certain kinship you make from getting yourself being being vulnerable in that moment and just saying, hey, I'm going to be cool with hanging out with a bunch of random strangers and learning from them. Right. And and giving to them whatever I can give and taking what makes sense to take. And, yeah, I, I still have friends from 25 years ago from that experience. And I and I think that's super important that people understand that you build the network before you need the network is really is really the trick to it and and the network building happens sort of any which way you can um my family laughs because i tell them this story about how i went to i think it was an isc squared like conference in new orleans and my husband came down to new orleans with me and we're walking down the street with the group of other security professionals from the conference and they turn around and they say to my husband george what are you doing here they didn't know me (laughs) they knew my (laughs) husband who's a fishing instructor (laughs) that is so cool that's not the only conference that has happened at right (laughs) and so the the networking like comes in in these sort of side things and so i think in my pancakes kind of talk i talk about how you look for those intersections of things that are important for you in the shared experience and that's how you build your network and find your community because it is that shared experience that builds out your network Awesome. Thank you for that. I, um, one of the things that I would just say, like from this, you guys are talking about connecting with people at CTFs. Um, the CTFs that I did were all virtual. So it was, I will say one of the regrets that I have is not like following up with those people afterwards and being like, Hey, like if you were on this journey together, let's, you know, continue the learning journey together. So for anybody who's listening, always follow up. Don't be afraid to like put yourself out there and say, Hey, let's connect on. Most LinkedIn, people whatever, whatever. actually care. Most yeah. people actually. That's the thing to that took me a long time to figure out. And I think it might have just been the niche of security that I was in, but there's like a world of difference in how some of the security folks are. Like when I went to my first AppSec USA, I think one of, um, I think he was managing a red team um, at a bank and um, we were talking about like culture and stuff like that. And he's like, yeah, like a lot of times at these conferences, it's like wizards fighting wizards. And so it's like, you have to be smart and like know what they're talking about to get in. And I, that always intimidated me. But the things that I liked about the the novice like CTFs is Everybody was really open and collaborative. And the thing that I love here at Jupiter One and a lot of the people that we've talked to on the show um, and continue to network with and like, you know, spread the wings of the show, like there's a whole group of people who are willing to to help you, to encourage you and to mentor and whatnot, which like has opened my eyes up to like, and that's honestly what gives me hope for security going forward, right? Is just the more collaborative nature that, that it we're trending into. So, yeah. So do I get to say in our book, can I say that? In our <laughs> yeah, book. Go for it. Yeah. In, in this mystical, magical thing that's coming soon. Right. We don't know if it's a book yet. <laughs> um, may actually talk a little bit about that and, and talk about how like everybody learns differently and how important it is to, to make sure you bring that all into the into the classroom and then stay connected that way after the fact. Mm -hmm. Um, On that note, so I know both you, Dr. Meg and Jasmine, and obviously Tyler, y'all have experience, you know, working with engineers 
and whatnot. And, you know, just this, the trend of more security awareness throughout the organization and whatnot. I'm curious to know, like, what, what have you seen, you know, through your own learning and then possibly experimenting with how other folks may learn? What have you seen worked well to build that security awareness across different business functions? Jasmine, go for it. I kind of feel like I want to punt this to Dr. Meg since she has a great, <laughs> okay. great story here. <laughs> All right, <Volume>. fine. <laughs> um, so there's a couple different things. So I, I will say that the first, the co community consensus awareness project that I contributed to back in 2000 by SANS, my chapter was called what me worry, um, which is a throwback to anybody who ever watches Mad, like ever read Mad Magazine. It was like a huge oh, thing, yeah, I was a but fan, it was one of time. those things where like I was writing about how executives just didn't really think that they were on anybody's radar. So they didn't really worry about security. And, you know, now you're fast forward and it's 2022 and some of that hasn't actually changed. <laughs> like you still are sort of there. And so I sort of think, if I go back and pull that community consensus, or I sort of want to reach out to all those authors and ask them if their thing still holds true, just to see how much security has changed versus not changed and what they would think was different. Um, but I think in particular, it's, it's making it real for people and making sure that they understand the impact that they may have. In the, in the book chapter, we talk about how security is everybody's responsibility. And, and I relay a story about how I did some training for engineers and I realized that they were working on a product, which was an incident response product that they didn't really understand what the point of it was. And so I, I work to get certified and train them in sort of hacking an incident response. So they understood what security professionals were looking at. And one day we were, so I'm in the room training developers basically on how to hack and why hacking is done and that sort of thing. And, um, I think in the book, I talk a little bit about war game scenario and, and say, look, you know, running scripts of today is not all that different than it was in war games. You could just pop in the, the disc and run the modem and, and dial things until you reach a connection that answers you. <laughs> and then you go see what you found and nothing's much changed. Um, but, but in particular, in this day, I went into the room after lunch and we started talking about SQL injection attacks. And I was maybe, I, I'm not even sure I had even gotten to the demo part when my lead database developer got up and left the room. And I followed him out because he really didn't look well. And I said, hey, are you okay? <laughs> like it was after lunch, things happened. I wanted to know if he was coming back. And he was like, um, I have to go fix our code like right now. Like right now, I can't even wait for your demo. I sort of just need to go take care of something, which told me a couple of things. A, he already knew how to fix whatever the problem was. He just hadn't been taught to look at it in a way where he considered it important enough to fix. Right. And so I think bringing in the this is why your contributions are important becomes super important, whether you're talking to the marketing team about the, the problems with, you know, posting posts with information in the background of, of people maybe that shouldn't be out there. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, but I think making that very real to them as to why their contributions is important is what's sort of successful about it. Like I, I actually had this conversation this morning with someone where we were talking about phishing campaigns and the complaints that we get about phishing training and why is that important? I said, well, maybe the problem is that we keep we're also running tools to block the phishing so they don't actually see how big a target we are. Can't we present it with those numbers that say, look, we realize that you don't understand that we are blocking this many attacks and this many of our executives are, are prime targets. But now that you understand that, like we're trying to make sure nothing gets through. 
<laughs> and if it gets through your backstop and you have to know how to respond and and that's your role in this in keeping the organization secure and so we're going to try to like pivot it slightly to have that conversation on how very important it is for everybody to just be aware of their surroundings and understand what they're looking at awesome thank you oh poor puppy <laughs> <laughs> that one's mine <laughs> it's it dinner time for him <laughs> it wouldn't be an episode without a puppy all right um Let's see. We're getting up on time because we're about 50, we're 50 minutes in. So um, wanted to take the time. Meg, Dr. Meg, you've talked about the book. So I wanted to open the floor. Jasmine, would you and Dr. Meg, would you like to just say a few words about this wonderful project that we've been working on? And I'm going to put up a link in here. So we have a book coming out uh, May 3rd called Reinventing Cybersecurity. And it is um, 17 or 18. Actually, are we at 18, yep. I think? Stories we of... Um, that's awesome. Yep. Uh, stories of women and non-binary trailblazers in security who are kind of rethinking craft and career paths. Um, this is a project we've been working on for, I think, a couple months now. Um, and we are kind of in the, you know, obviously the, the kind of final editing, formatting phase. Um, it's been, I think, a really transformative project. And I, I think it's a, a book that the, the world really needs as well. Yeah, I agree. I'm super, excited. I, I, I'm super excited about it. I think um, it was some of some of the contributors I've known for a little while, while others, they were brand new to me. And, you know, we get into Slack, and then they leave me wondering, have I sworn enough in my chapter while others are busy <laughs> swear, thinking, did it maybe I swear too much in my chapter? And I'm like, wait, maybe I need to go back and look at my chapter again. And then, you know, Jasmine brought out this awesome cover art that just, like, that's the way a lot of us feel a lot of the time. A little bit bags under the eyes. We've got, you know, tape on our cheeks kind of holding us together but we're going to keep pushing forward and and you know have this awesome kind of energy around us and it just it, it was a super motivating group to be a part of and just kind of work through the project with awesome yep so for those of you on the line or watching this later um that link up there if you want to get uh notified when this goes live go ahead and sign up there and we will send that over to you once it's ready yeah, just uh, just for those that might be listening to it to audio only, it's bit.ly, bit.ly slash reinventing dash cyber. That is the pre-registration for the pre-announce that is exclusive to the show. Actually, I believe right now we've not pre-announced this anywhere else at this point. So uh, more Other than more Twitter and LinkedIn. LinkedIn. <laughs> You know, on social media. But we only did it today. But we <laughs> yes. only did it today. Today, so, yes. Yes. today is right. our big right. launch, our big pre-launch day. Um, and right. so, so semi-exclusive. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> so I may have awesome. accidentally said something about it internally yesterday, but trust me. That's, that's okay. Dramatic. Come I was on. like, oops, I wasn't supposed to tell you that till tomorrow. <laughs> You're totally fine. I mean, I think we're all excited about just the innovation that's happening, all the authors that are sharing their stories and um, how mm -hmm. they're transforming processes internally and how people are learning and um, how people are just paving their way into career paths. Uh, they're just all amazing stories. So I really highly recommend you guys signing up um, and looking forward to that. So absolutely. So again, once again, it's bit.ly slash reinventing dash cyber. You can also go to jupiter1.com and get the scar report that Jasmine has uh, led um, inside of Jupiter One. I highly recommend reading that report as well. Um, Ash, how about how about we do a fun little game to wrap up today? What are you thinking? Yeah, I, I'm so excited. Okay, so Transitioning into the game. So the game that we're going to play today is called the five second rule. Well, it's called that on Amazon, but we're doing our it's own. It's called version. what? Five second rule. You know, like you drop food and you got five seconds to eat it. Oh, uh, okay. You know, right. don't really have that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a thing. Okay. Speaking of but, someone with who had young people with magnifying glass don't believe everything you read about five seconds that's not a thing <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay so 
um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, uh, we're going to go around in, in an order. Um, and so Tyler, you're going to be my guinea pig for this first one. Of course. Um, the idea is I will say a topic, uh, and then you will say the first things that come to your mind within five seconds for that topic. So for example, three colors, we got to go quick, quick. You want me to put the timer? Well, we don't know what the order is because your your circular order. She is said you were first. You're first. Right, but yeah. Thank you, Doctor Med's listening. <laughs> but who's second? I'll ask them. No, no, no. You have to go with. You have oh, to red, say white, three blue. colors. Good job. Okay, okay. We're going places. Um, We're going Jasmine. Places. Three veggies. Uh, snap peas, cabbage, and lettuce. Oh, Ooh. interesting. Good choices. Are those your three favorite or your three worst? <laughs> I don't know. They were just the first three that came to mind. Two of the three of those are my worst. <laughs> which two? Yeah, which two? Snap peas are amazing. Okay. The other two yeah. are horrible. <laughs> I think cabbage is really underrated. I'm pretty sure you need to have a little halupki and that'll change your mind there, Tyler. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Meg Layton. Three flavors of ice cream. Uh, moose tracks, mint chocolate chip, and chocolate. God, nice. I'm so boring. I went straight to Neapolitan, strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate. <laughs> so I'm basic. So boring. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tyler, three brands of shoes. Shoes? Yes. Shoes. Oh, gosh. Okay. On. The random. On, on clouds, because that happens to be what I'm wearing at the moment. Christian Louis Vuitton, because that's always what my wife dreams of having. And then Nike, because it's the only other thing I can think of very quickly. I love that. I Nike know it was a very bizarre answer. It was like all over the board, but. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, let's do Jasmine. Three brands of hair product. Oh, um, Giovanni, uh, Mane and Tail, and Pantene. Nice. Very nice. So the funny thing is the only one I've heard of before is Pantene, but you know, for those that have video, you can see why <laughs> I don't have a clue about hair products. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Meg, three favorite cybersecurity vendors. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Flip it on its head and I can tell you the three. Weeks, so you have that. <laughs> oh, now, now you're a little little up there in things that Meg might get in trouble with. Uh, <laughs> three things Meg might get in trouble with. Let me think. How will that work? Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll say semantic, although I'm not sure that's still a vendor all by itself. <laughs> so I'm confused. I'll go ahead and say Jupiter 1. Yes, oh, all you. here. <laughs> and um, I'll put Microsoft out there. All right. Very like nice. That. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate that. Put, All right, Tyler. In high regard there. I like it. Yes. Thank you. Um, three best college basketball teams. Three. Carolina, Not Carolina, and Carolina. No, no, no. Hey, hey. Three different UConn ones. women. Do they have to be male? <laughs> they don't. UNC all day, first and foremost. Uh-huh. I've, I've got to go with my alma maters. UNC. James Madison Dukes, the Dukes of James Madison University for my second one. Uh, and then I'll say Rochester Institute of Technology for their amazing hockey team. Oh, that's not a basketball team, but okay. Those are my three favorite sports teams. Oh, I thought you said <laughs> sports ball. I didn't realize you said basketball. No, I said basketball, but it's fine. Oh, well, if I'll I'm going basketball, it's got to be UNC. Oh, my gosh, there's nobody else I root for. I like Syracuse because that's where <laughs> I grew up. Um, I'm stretching to find a third. It's okay. That's fine. He's no out of worries. five seconds, too. <laughs> yeah, definitely God, way over five seconds on that one. High standard here. Yes, come on, Tyler. Uh, okay, Jasmine, three favorite security learning resources. Oh, wow. Um, it's okay if you're not five seconds. Reddit. Ah. Um, Any particular sub Reddit? Just all of it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Telegram and then the oh. Diana Initiative. Oh, I don't know why that was so rough for me. <laughs> That's okay. You're 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 recovering right now, so you're good. Um, okay, 
Dr. Meg, three animals you would not want as a pet. Three animals I would not want as a pet. Ooh, that's tough. So rhinoceros, <laughs> um, giraffe, <laughs> and I don't know, maybe a gorilla. <laughs> Ooh, definitely not on the gorilla. Okay. I just uh, think giraffes would be really high maintenance. Yes. Uh, ha, ha. Oh man. Um okay, Tyler, three Olympic cities. Oh, um Nagano, uh Lake Placid, Los Angeles. Good job. I think LA is a. Is I think they them? were in the seventies, if I recall, okay. but I may not be I right. Remember. Okay, uh, Jasmine, three role models: Doctor Meg Layton, <laughs> Tyler Shield, <laughs> <laughs> and then Becky Bass. Oh, yes, nice. Becky Bass. I'm glad you um, saw my posing to force my way into that second <laughs> one because I know I wouldn't have been there, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> Okay, we'll do one more. Oh, oh sorry, Dr. Meg Layton. Oh my gosh. Um, let me see. I have, I have a lot of different ones here. Your three favorite movies. Well, something simple. My three favorite movies: Princess Bride. Yeah. Inconceivable. <laughs> Inconceivable. I do not think that means what you think it means. <laughs> <laughs> um, Spaceballs. Um, and. I'll go ahead and put sneakers out there. I All love right. those first two. I've seen those first two probably 50 times each. I also think Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with Robert Redford and, and uh, Paul Newman are things I can watch like over and over and over and over again. Best kind of movies. All right, last round. Last round, Tyler. Tyler, you ready for this one? No, I'm not listening to you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to tell you anyways. Three of the worst actors and actresses. I already know you're going to, one of them that you're going to say. Of course. Neo, uh, what's his name? <laughs> you don't even know his name. <laughs> That's how important he is to me. He's one of the worst actors in Hollywood. Oh, come on, Bill and Ted. <laughs> yeah, him. We've had this debate on the show many, many times on many episodes of this show. But whatever his name is, because my brain is broken and I'm old, uh, him... Keanu, Canoe, Canoe Reeves, one of the worst actors in, in television. Um, gosh, Canoe's up there. Uh, we've had this debate a bunch. I know my, my synapses are not firing, actually. Um, golly, you sprung this one on me. And I know we've had this conversation. Who else have we debated? You're on mute or something. Can't hear you. I am. I'm, I accidentally hit my mic. Sorry. There you go. I was just saying, it's okay if you just stick with one. We just know that. No, 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 because we've had this debate. Who are the other ones that we always circle in on? Do you remember? Mm, I think you've hated on Marky Mark before. No, I don't mind Marky Mark. He's pretty good. Oh. Uh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. And go <laughs> Kristen one. Stewart. I was going to say people on the chat seem to have opinions. Yes. <laughs> Do you like Kristen Stewart? Bella. Oh, Kristen Bella? Stewart, definitely Bella? horrible. I thought we were, I was um, only thinking men in my head because the term actor and actress. But yes, Kristen actress Stewart is freaking awful cake, too. No. What was the third one? I don't know. I thought I only remembered us debating Marky Mark and Keanu. So go ahead and go around the horn with the rest of your okay. rest of your comments. I'll, I'll right, come up right. with the third one. Jasmine, three fictional badass female characters. Oh. Well, definitely Charlie's Theron Furiosa and Mad Max Fury Road. And I feel like you don't need another two. Except Buffy. Buffy. <laughs> and then Angelina Jolie's character in Hackers. Nice. Whose name, I can't remember her name in the movie right now. I can't right remember now. her name either. Oh, yeah. Angelina um, Jolie was in was Hackers? It, yeah, oh, yes, yeah. yeah. She, she was, was like, now I have to go yeah. watch that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Meg Layton, one more. Let's hear. 
three Vin books Diesel. you would recommend. You don't <laughs> like Vin Diesel? No, he's a horrible actor. Oh, that makes me so sad. I can't. He's a horrible I can't actor. with you. He's a horrible actor. Okay, we're go gonna, ahead. We're gonna I feel nothing. To Dr. I feel nothing about that opinion. In that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Fast and Furious fan, so ex nay on Tyler right now. Um, okay, Dr. Meg, three books that you would recommend. Three books I would recommend. Wow. On any topic. Okay, so I'm going to say Reinventing Cybersecurity. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, 97 Things Every Information Security Professional Should Know. I have a chapter in that book, too. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. <laughs> How's that? And I'm a big fan of the code book. The code book? Yeah, it talks about encryption and encoding and things and history, oh. and it's, it's really fascinating. Interesting. I've okay. read it like five times so far, and every couple of years I read it again. Okay. Well, I will make note of that and probably put some links in post notes, post show description. So, anyways, that was that was my game for today, and I feel like I learned a little bit more about each of you today, including Thank Tyler's you, hate Ashley, for Vin Diesel. For setting that up, I'm going to be um, flipping the script soon, and we're going to hit you with a game. So be prepared. Okay, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> Alrighty, I think we are over time at this point. So uh, thank you, wonderful Dr. Meg, Jasmine. It's been wonderful hanging out with you today um, and getting to know you and just learning more about your own journeys into cyber and recommendations that you have for folks that are adventuring in. So with that, Tyler... No, I'm going to be gentle today and just be like, hey, it's been a pleasure. Wow. That's so nice. See you guys. Okay. See we'll ya. see you next time. Thanks for having us. All so, right. Um, I do want to bring up a real quick topic on your on your um, movies. Worst, worst actors and actresses comment. Mm -hmm. um, this wonderful person here, my <laughs> wife commented uh, in the yeah. chat. That's and what I was agrees, saying. She agrees with me that Kristen Stewart is one of the worst actors slash actresses in Hollywood. So thank you, honey, for your contribution to today's show. I also would like to call out uh, Evie for commenting on my on brand, my on cloud brand recommendation, which I highly recommend. They are the most comfortable shoes I've ever owned in my life. I highly recommend getting those shoes. So I want to get those shout outs before we wrap in the show. Um, what's going on next week? What's what's or two weeks from now? What's the next show? Do you know off the top of your head who the next guest is? Are we teasing yeah. it? Are we are we talking about yeah, it yet? Chat about it. Yeah. So our next uh, guest will be Clint Gibbler. He is ah. the um, he runs the TLDR newsletter. He works at R two C and he's the head of security research over there. Um, he's a really cool person. In our prep call yesterday, I just got to. Hear a little bit more about Clint how is amazing. So, so, real quickly, I want to pre I want to pre announce this one because I want to I want to kind of press on that a little bit. Clint Gibbler, he he runs TLDR Sec. There's a handful of pieces of email I get a week that I care about, like personal email that I'm like, I got to read this stuff. This stuff's amazing. The TL semicolon dr TLDR Sec mailing list. If you're not on it, go get on it because. He curates all of the most amazing content, and he's got this really cool, unique wit about his commentary that I highly recommend. If, if you haven't subscribed to TLDR Sec, go subscribe to it. We're going to have him on the show next week, and I think it's going to be a really, really cool show. In two, two weeks. weeks. When I say next week, I mean two weeks out. Yes, April 19th. However, next week, if you want to tune in on YouTube again, we are running our 100X Engineering. So if you want to get a taste of you know our development team and their culture, feel free to join in. Definitely, because my wife, Kelly Shields, who's uh, commented with a heart, will also tune into that. Um, <laughs> go check it out. She'll she'll make some comments that are completely irrelevant because she doesn't work in cyber, but I'm going to make her watch it anyways. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate you all, and we will see you next time. See you next time, everyone. <laughs>